title for our message this morning is Gender and Sexuality, Understanding and Celebrating Who We Are. And I have to give credit for some of the slides that I borrowed from uh, Claire Walsh. She uh, teaches at Georgia Southern, Department of Sociology and Anthropology here at Georgia Southern. And so I was, as I was preparing, I thought, you know, she already has some of these slides. Let me contact her and see if I can borrow some. So some of these come from her. Not this one, though. This is the alphabet soup. As most of you know, that's what sometimes we call all these letters we continue to add on. I wrote a little song about it. It says LGBTQIA, so much to know, I'm in dismay. Gender and sexuality, much to learn for little old me. LGBTQIA, please tell me what is right to say. You ever felt that way? Like I'm not sure I quite got it all. So let's think about gender for just a minute and how and where is gender made visible. It's really everywhere. You know, on our passports, birth certificates, and the time we're born, there it is. Mark that box. People want to know. I have a whole little Alec this morning. People walk in and said, is it a boy or a girl? You know, what box can I put this child in? I used to teach school and I did this. I don't know if you... All you boys, you line up on one side, all the girls line up on the other. I did it. You may have to. It's what we teach children, who we teach them they are, and what we teach them that they are supposed to like. It has to do with all those kinds of things, too. We have bathrooms, not in this building, but in many of our buildings that are labeled. This is where you go. I got a shirt, though, from... George Decay that says, you can pee next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's even in our Kleenex box. You got, do you want to get the manly size Kleenex? What is it, do, you, do you really need a bigger Kleenex, man? Maybe you do. I don't know. It's everywhere. In all kinds of situations, gender is made visible and gender is revealed. And it's usually revealed in two categories. It's revealed, both gender and sexuality usually is revealed as a binary. We think of these things in two boxes. And part of that is because we seem to have this tendency, human beings do, to put things in boxes, to categorize them. Part of that so we can talk about them, but a lot of times we put them in the boxes and we leave nothing possible in between. And often there is a hierarchy in the boxes. One of the boxes is sometimes more valuable than the other box. But we're going to deconstruct this binary a little bit. The binary is, for the sex category, we usually say male or female. Which is it? And that is a biological construct. We do have genes that people can look at that are XY or XX. You learned about that in biology. Well, sometimes there are some that aren't exactly that, but that's what we learn gender and how we present ourselves and masculine feminine you know which way are we what box and that's that's a social construct that we learn about and we present ourselves in that way and then even in sexual orientation people think well you either got to desire women or you got to desire men again two boxes we're going to deconstruct that a little bit we're going to start with sex and that one should be clear well surely that one biological sex Surely there are just two boxes for that, right? Well, no. There's intersex. Even in biology. The intersex is a general term used for a variety of conditions in which a person is born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't seem to fit the typical definitions of female or male. And this little box down here is actually something that doctors used to use. They would use this to measure, to determine, okay, are we gonna call this a girl or call this a boy? Are we going to recommend that the parents do surgery? And if we are, what kind of surgery are we gonna recommend? And then sometimes intersex babies are not even recognized as intersex. They may really appear more girl or boy and be announced that way. And it may not be until later on that maybe when they reach um, adolescence, that something occurs that they realize that that may not be the right assignment. 
Or sometimes what they found out with these women in sports, some of these women have done exceptionally well, and then they've had their uh, DNA tested, and they said, wait a minute, these, these, they don't have the same chromosomes that we thought they would have. And are we going to allow them to play sports by how they've identified all their lives? So it's not clearly two boxes, even with biological sex. And of course, with other kinds of gender, it's also not two boxes. Indeed, it's usually thought of as a continuum. Now, I especially like this gender-bred person. This is something that she used. Uh, I printed out this little book for you, and you can look at it later, Defining LGBT. Q, a guide to gender and sexuality terminology, and they use a lot of the gender red person to talk about this, because it says, you know, gender identity itself, how you think of yourself, is more of a head thing. That's more in your head, your brain. You think of yourself as male or female, as a man or a woman, or think of how your woman is a man that's it's created. Then gender expression, that's how you express yourself, by what you're wearing that day, how you your mannerisms, those kinds of things, that, as you see the expressions in your whole body, your whole body, and then biological sex, that's your femaleness or your maleness. They, so some folks say it's a continuum. And the gender part, the gender part, many folks say is actually a performance. You perform gender in certain ways. So I've got a video, I'm gonna show you a little, a little short part of it of a Harvard sailing team, and they are doing gender, are performing gender. And so this Harvard sailing team, as you watch them, they're not, pro they're pro they, it's a real performance. They're performing in a way that perhaps they wouldn't normally perform. We'll watch a little bit of it. Wait, who got voted off last week? The brothers. They were the brothers? The two fat brothers, yeah. Hey, you guys hungry or something? You know, I could share something. Okay, um, let me call Rebecca and just make sure um, we're not gonna go out later, because if we're gonna go out later, then I'm not gonna eat anything now. Hey, honey, how's it going? What are you doing? Who are you with? Where are you? Are you doing something cool? I wanna know what you're doing and wh who you're talking to, and I wanna know everything that you're doing, and I don't want you to act like I'm being annoying. I just want you to answer all my questions. Well, all right, well, um, listen, do you wanna go out later? Because if we're gonna go out later, then I'm not gonna eat anything now. Okay, great, so let's go out later, great. I'm excited, date. All right, I love you. Honey, I love you. Rebecca, say I love you to me. Tell me you love me. All right, I love you too. Bye. Well, what does she say? She does she does she does she does she does she feel about it and what is she thinking about how she feels? Um, she's with the girls, uh, she's with Jen, Farron, uh, Katie, and Sarah. Oh, that's a good group. That's a really good group. And they're watching the foot game, the foot game, whatever. They are uh, not going to eat. So I'm not going to eat because we're going to go out later. Sure. So that's funny. You hear it kind of laugh at it. And it's funny because it's not what we expect. It's not, it's, they're, they're, it's not the expectancy we would have of these guys sitting there watching a television program. And when folks don't fall into what we expect, it's either funny to us or scary to us sometimes. We have expectancies and then sometimes our, our expressions then are like, this isn't right in some way. It's funny or it's fearful or something like that. So let's look at another part of this. We've looked at gender and how that's a performance and how people are expected to perform in certain ways as gender. Now let's look at sexuality, which is also a continuum. It is not just that you are just, you're either you're attracted to women and most people say, well, men are attracted to women. And then if men aren't attracted to women, then those are the gay men, you know? They're attracted to men, right? And then women are attracted to men, and if they're not, then they're lesbians, and so that, those are the two things. But indeed, it is also a continuum. It's not, you can't put it in boxes. There are some people who are attracted to nobody, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there's a continuum of how their attractiveness to men is and their attractiveness to women. And then they see it, they even divide it up. They say, you know, attractiveness has two aspects, maybe it has three or four, but they divide it in at least two, sexually attractive and romantically attractive. You could be romantically attracted to somebody that you really are not sexually attracted to, although there is often overlap. 
So we go back to this alphabet soup thing and who is what and how do we know that we're saying the right thing and using the right words. I feel like most of us here are pretty used to the first, first four because we've been using them a long time. So we say, okay, we, get, we, we know about lesbian, we, okay, that's lesbian, that's women that are attracted to women. Got that pretty good. Gay, a lot of times we use that as men that are attracted to men, although the term gay is more of an umbrella term and some women that are attracted to women also use the word gay. I can remember Ellen DeGeneres on her program when she said into the microphone, I'm gay, you know, so. And then bisexual, we recognize that. There are some people who are attracted to both men and women. So we've got that, that down pretty good, I think. We don't need a lot more explanation of that in this group. And then the T is really not about sexual attraction. The T is really about gender, but it's kind of all in there together when you talk about gender and sexuality. So, and we have talked a good bit in this congregation about trans folks, but maybe we need a little more explanation there. So I have to, I'm going to use this slide that transgender is an umbrella term. So people need to understand that. Everybody that identifies trans is not going to be somebody that actually transitions all the way and has surgery. Somebody that just cross-dresses, anything from that to somebody that completely transitions may call themselves transgender. It's an umbrella term for those whose gender identity and or expression does not normatively align with the sex into which they were categorized at birth. So they may identify as a trans person. A trans man would be somebody that at birth was identified as female. A trans woman would be somebody that at birth was identified as male, but now identifies as a woman. Now this other term though is newer. We usually just talk about trans and then what? Biological or normal or whatever. Well, that's not right. You know, we, if, there, if, we, if we have a way that we look at ourselves in terms of gender, we need to have a name for that. So we have cisgender, a term describing non-transgender person. And that's preferred over saying, well, she's a biological woman. And she's cisgender. Her, her expression, gender expression, matches, aligns with how she was assigned at birth. This term is used specifically to refer to non-trans people since the identities are often unmade or taken for granted. It's almost like you don't have to think about it. So now, by having an identity, maybe we do have to think about it. So this is unlike the identities of trans peers, which often do get this hyper scrutiny. So now, when sometimes in some groups, when I identify myself, we go around and telling all our identities, I include cisgender, because the way I present myself matches uh, my assignment at birth. But then with this alphabet suit thing as we go on, it gets a little more confusing. You know, BGTQIA will say, what is the Q? What is the Q? Well, actually, it could be a couple of different things. One is queer. Now, queer is also an umbrella term that many folks use to describe individuals who are not straight. You know, so it's also used to describe people who maybe were non-normative in their gender identity, or sometimes people use it as a philosophy, a way of thinking. Um, we talk about some people that have a queer curriculum or a <laughs> queer political identity. Just not straight, you know. Now, you have to be careful with the term queer. There are folks, especially older folks, who do not want you to use that because they grew up with it being a derogatory term, and uh, they prefer not to be identified as queer because that was the term used to put them down. And when I was a child growing up, that was a very derogatory term, and now many people claim it. Uh, the other cue is questioning. This is true especially for many young folks, but not necessarily young folks, maybe older folks too who are going through a phase in their life where they said, I'm not quite sure of my gender identity. So I'm exploring, I'm questioning. This symbol is for intersex, and we've already talked about that in terms of a biological identity. Of uh, the A, so what's the A for? Well, when I first heard the A, I heard it from some woman that says, where's my letter? I'm an ally, I want a letter too, I'm being left out. And so some people say the A stands for ally, and it's all those who identify with the LGBTQ community 
get invited to their parties and stuff, you know, <laughs> because they are strong allies. But then there, there's some other folks that says, no, the A is ours. We claim the A. It's asexual. That's what A is. And I have a video that shares a little more about that in a minute. And then there is uh, now also a P. That's pansexual. Okay. So uh, is that all the letters? No, there, there could be more and more and more, you know? It, for instance, there's autosexual. That's someone who loves themselves. When I was single, I used to say, I'm the only lover that will never leave me. But now I've got Greg. <laughs> but, but yes, and there are others. So you could, you could have more and more letters, you know? So it's certainly not two boxes up. It's certainly more than two boxes. And then you have more folks now that are referring to themselves as just non-binary, saying, just don't put me in either one of those boxes, you know. Then that causes the concern some of us having the problem with, well, what do we do about the pronoun? Because our English language just doesn't, doesn't have uh, enough pronouns to cover that. And so some folks created some program, uh, pronouns, but now uh, the people in the dictionaries have decided that singular they is okay. So now many of us use they for the pronoun for non-binary folks. Um, so what is asexuality? Uh, asexuality is for folks who just don't have a sexual attraction. And I have a short part of a video I'm going to show you about that. Asexuality is an orientation in which the individual does not experience sexual attraction. Heterosexuality is attraction to opposite gender. Homosexuality is attraction to the same gender. I'm not interested in having sexual contact with a male or female or any gender. Asexuality is very much not the same thing as being celibate. Celibacy is a choice. Planning for the future for someone that you want to save yourself for. Asexuality is a sexual orientation and therefore not a choice. So that's a little bit about, gives you a little more information about someone that identifies as asexual. So now, LGBTQIA, now I know just what to say. Well, maybe, <laughs> but a little bit more. Uh, so I have a little bit better understanding. So let's look at this genderbred person one more time. The genderbred person is saying it's not a binary, it's a continuum, both with gender identity, womanness or manness, gender expression, how you're feminine or masculine, biological sex, femaleness, maleness, and with your, how you're sexually attracted to, from nobody, to either attracted to females or attracted to men, how you're romantically attracted, not a binary. In fact, I think for some people it may be not only a continuum, maybe it's a spiral, you know, <laughs> or some other metaphor. So why are we talking about this at church? Well, it's October, you know, this is LGBTQ History Month, National Coming Out Month, but also we're talking about it because of our first principle. Read this with me. We affirm and support the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And in our society today, we are still not there, folks. We are still not there, especially with some groups. This is Malaysia Booker, a 23-year-old. In this picture, she, you can see the tears flowing from her because she was at a, a, an event where she was describing an attack that was captured on video and garnered national attention. But after that, she was shot to death, shot to death. And she is not the only trans woman that's happened to this year. In the United States this year, at least the ones that were reported that we know about, at least 18 transgender people, most of them transgender women of color have been killed in a wave of violence that the American Medical Association has declared an epidemic. And last year, there were 26 reported, 26 reported. So this is just one, one of the group, one of the letters of the alphabet. We know that the, in many of the others, uh, we know that the, the LGBTQ population, we, I'll say LGBTQ+, plus because I don't know all the letters there could be population. They're very vulnerable for sex trafficking. Karen has talked to us about that before. They're uh, very vulnerable for suicide if they have been, uh, uh, especially if their parents and, and people they love do not accept them. So we, we had this video that came out a couple of years it's that ago where people were saying, it's getting better though, it's getting better. You know, remember that? It's getting better, it's getting better. 
Is it getting better? Yes, it is. More people are coming out and more people are proud to be out as who they are. But what we're seeing now is a backlash. It's a backlash that not only we see with LGBTQ populations, but we see with immigrant populations, we see with people of color, we see with folks that have maybe a very different religious practices, including maybe for some Unitarian Universalism. We see it in, with poor people of all types. There is a backlash in our situation today where when we're trying to lift up and be inclusive, there are those that are coming forward, even in our own community this past week with the book burning, coming forward and feeling somehow that it's okay, that it's okay to lash out and bully and be mean and be destructive and even kill people. So, we come here. My sermon series this uh, fall is, Why Are We Here? And we talk about other reasons we come here. Well, we come here also, yes, to celebrate who we are, but we also come here to support one another and to be here for one another. You know, I shared with you, this is the same fellow I talked about earlier, Dr. Glenn Thomas Rideout. I heard him a couple of times at, at General Assembly. And he sang a song at the 2015 closing ceremony that I want to share with you in a minute to close this out. And it's, I need you to survive. And one reason we come here is because we need each other to survive. Sometimes literally. Sometimes literally. Now, when he sings, he may be using theology that's not your theology, folks, but remember what he said, okay? And just try to understand the meaning behind it. And, and love it. the meaning behind it is that we care for one another and love one another. We've got to be there for one another. And when he gets to the part where it says, I pray for you, you pray for me, I'll ask you, by then we'll pass the, uh, the plates around, I'll ask you to stand and sing with him and sing to each other. Let's sing together. 
I pray, you pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you. With words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. I pray for you. more time. 